My name's Emma, I read six books this month, so let's talk about them. Just a quick reminder, I tend to split my videos up into chapters, so feel free to take a little browse down here, see if there's a book you want to hear about more than others, but if you want to just sit through the whole thing, that's cool with me. I'm going to start with the digital books, just so I don't forget which ones I read. <laughs> so I read two digital books. One was a random purchase, it was on a deal, and that is The Crow Folk. So I'd just come off some pretty chunky books, uh, I'd read The Ember Blade last month, and it seemed like it would be a lighter book to get through, and it was, which is great. Um, it was, it was fine, it was okay, it was it's a solid three and a half. <laughs> I think, I really, I like comedy books, but basically it's set in the UK during the war. It's in a like quaint British village. Um, and I normally love fancy books when they actually go in that direction. Um, obviously we get so much London settings. Um, I'm guilty of writing about London. <laughs> um, so I kind of like that. Uh, and there is some witchy, magical nonsense going on. There are these scarecrows that are coming back to life because this pumpkin head creepy scarecrow is bringing them back to life. It kind of features a lot of, like, <laughs> British dialect, but it always feels just like a little bit over the top. Um, you know, on the lighter end would be a lot of oh, blooming heck and things like that, but it felt like it overdid it at times. Um, and the story itself is just like quite gentle, nothing too incredible out there. Um, it was a nice light read, which is what I was after at the time, uh, but I did find that once I was about two-thirds and I was sort of ready to be done and move on to more exciting things. Uh, so that's Crowfolk. It's fine. Next is a book that's going to be trickier to talk about and that is Harrow the Ninth. The reason for this is that I don't want to spoil Gideon the Ninth and a lot of the ending of that kind of determined how I thought I would feel about this one, if that makes sense. <laughs> Basically, something happens at the end of Gideon the Ninth, and for that reason, I left it a long time before I was, I thought I'd be ready for this one. Uh, and I was right, I kind of had to, I knew I'd have to come to this book on its own terms, uh, and, and that is something you have to bear in mind. So I'd heard about the second person narrative, uh, like many of the people, I really don't like second person. As a aside, I actually remember doing a bit of a book swap or I was very heavily into writing groups and things and I said I would have a look at someone's first chapter. Oh my god, it was like second, no, second person present tense. So it re read like a adventure book, so it was like, you move forward through the room, you pick this up. It's not, thankfully Harrow the Ninth isn't quite like that, it is told, it is past tense, so it's you did this. Um, I was, I would say too much, but I kind of had a feeling that there was a reason for this, and there is, um, so it, it definitely gets away with it where not everyone else would, and not every other book would. Uh, as for the story itself, it's a lot more <sighs> sombre. Um, this, so Harrow the Night, Harrow is kind of gone mad a little bit, but you're sort of <laughs> seeing the story through her eyes um, and there's a bit of a unreliable narrator thing going on. 
Um, and a lot of the humour that was in Gideon the Ninth is not gone, but it is way more muted because obviously Harrow is not... We're following Harrow and she's not as outwardly funny as Gideon is. There is still a bit of humour peppered throughout um, and we do get quite a chunk more towards the end. Um, so it's not completely absent. It doesn't feel like it's a completely different world, uh, but there is definitely a whole very different feeling to this book. But it is so well written, so well done. Um, I will say because of that framing, like, I think I said this in my last video, um, I did reach a point where I was ready to be done with not knowing everything um yeah chunks of the book will happen and you'll just be like i don't i don't really know what just happened i don't yeah i i'm not sure what's going on <laughs> and that will happen a lot and uh you know that really is on purpose i think um so you have to be willing to go along with that um and um, there was like a moment maybe about halfway through where I was like I am kind of done I I really want to get to the bit where all of this starts to make sense um it was only once and I think that might have been because I then started to want to power through um I don't know if powering through helped because it got me to the cool bit sooner or whether it actually harmed it because I spent it felt like I was spending really a really long time like these really long reading sessions not knowing what the fuck was going on <laughs> but by the end yes it makes sense or a lot of it makes sense um so i'd if you've read gideon and you'd like gideon i'd definitely recommend it just bear those things in mind and <laughs> uh a quick extra point about this and i said this about gideon um and i i have made a video about gideon i think um i recommend getting it in paperback because again with gideon i read it digitally and then at the end there's like uh, a glossary and a list of characters and i was like i are you kidding me i could have i really needed this and obviously digitally it's really hard to jump back into and i don't think there's like a chapter marker for it i actually i'm pretty sure i looked with harrow because with harrow the night it introduces new concepts so the same thing happened again. I was like, <sighs> like if I've got the first book digitally, I'll tend to get the second book digitally. Uh, and I really should have just looked for them both used or something. <laughs> um, so I think that will go a long way to helping your experience um, because like they were mentioning uh, heralds, I think. And I was like, are these people on their side? Are these... and. I wasn't getting enough context from the story of what these things were until we, until, until we were right at the end. So that's a bit of advice. <laughs> Get the physical version if you're going to try it. Or, I don't know if the glossary is online, maybe try and find the glossary or bookmark it or something so that you can get to it quickly if you really want the digital version. Next on the list is Flesh Eater. This is a self-pub novel, uh, as I showed off in a in my last book haul, I think. Uh, I went to grab a few different uh, self-pub fantasies. Um, I kind of, I wanted to support fellow writers, um, as I've probably mentioned before, hopefully I <laughs> have. Uh, I've self-pubbed a couple of books um, and so it would feel hypocritical of me to ask other people to check my book out if I wasn't doing the same for other authors um, and plus I think it's just quite a cool way to discover completely different stories. Um, so this one I went in <laughs> with completely different expectations to what I came away with. <laughs> the back, the blurb on the back and the sort of like dark aesthetic of the cover, I really thought this would be a really dark, weird, maybe a little bit creepy story. Um, 
So it wasn't as dark as I was expecting it to be. It was still quite weird. So the thing is, this one is that every character is a anthropomorphic animal. This is a fantasy. It's based. <laughs> I know it's a really lazy comparison, but it's basically Zootopia, but put through a bunch of other fantasy cyberpunk filters. Um, so the main character is a fox uh, and he is on the run um, and he has been chased down because he has been labelled a flesh eater. So anyone who eats the flesh of a, another animal, um, this doesn't have to be just anthropomorphic people, this is like all animals I think barring from insects. And if you're caught eating flesh uh you will be sent to like a, a prison a work camp basically it's the worst thing that you could be it's the worst crime that you can commit and um, through flashbacks we find out why he's been labeled this way and um, whether that's true or not and it's how do i feel about this <laughs> I think the thing is the topics covered are quite dark at times but the tone of the book is generally on the lighter side and so it is a really good example of how you can include a lot of you know we can have gangsters we can have uh violence we can have death but if it's told in a sort of lighter tone um it's almost like the equivalent of like PG-13 for films, you know, there could be violence, but as long as the blood is absent, then that's fine. <laughs> um, it's not quite, the thing is that it, the tone wasn't what I was after when I was going into it, but once I realised what I was getting in for, I kind of settled into it and it was fine. Um, it's an enjoyable story. Uh, there was an unexpected romance. I think that was probably the highlight of the book. Um, but I will say there wasn't really too many surprises um, other than a bit of a very left field reveal at the end that completely threw me. Um, <laughs> yeah, very strange. Um, yeah, and there's, there's great, the world building is great, um, it really is a case of what if animals were building up cities, what do they eat, there's a lot of, um, like I said, you know, they're either eating insects or they're eating vegetables, uh, so there's a lot of food scenes, which are really cool. Um, it was enjoyable, I don't think I have anything much else to say about it, um, it was good fun. If you want a sneaky LGBT romance <laughs> in your fantasy, this isn't something to look at. Sadly it didn't fully blow me away but I enjoyed my time with it and it's just under 400 pages so it doesn't completely outstay its welcome either. It it has great pacing um, so I was never bored at any point. Um, it just sort of trundled along at a good pace. Um, so it might be well for you to check out. Now we get into a chunk of the Japanese classics as my read through continues. Uh, so I was most of the way through the Makioki Sisters by the end of last month and obviously finished it this month. And then these are the two novellas that I was able to get through in probably a week. And there's a reason why it took me that long. It would normally be a lot quicker. Uh, I'm not like showing off. <laughs> I could just read it in a day, it's fine. No, there's there's a reason why it took me a while, so we'll we'll get there, we'll get there. So let's discuss the Makioka sisters. This is set uh, again, this is another book where I kind of had some expectations that were not met at all. So it's set uh, on the run-up to World War Two and then there's some crossover so some of I'd say probably the second half of the book is happening whilst the war is starting or is ramping up 
Um, so I was really waiting for like something like the pennies to drop or something to happen at the midway point and for like one of the characters to be one of the husbands to be pulled off to war or something and that didn't happen <laughs> so what this really is is just like a, a snapshot's not right because it covers like years of their lives but it is a look at a sort of portion of Japanese society right before Japan was sort of like modernized and really westernized you know after World War II um, there was like American occupation um, and so there was a lot of American imports at that point but that's not to say that there wasn't some westernization um, you know this book makes a point between who's wearing western clothes and who's still wearing kimonos every day so it's really on that sort of term from like traditional to um, sort of like more modern Japan. But the family that we follow is very traditional. You know, they... <laughs> the best comparison I can say is if you have watched Fruits Basket or read the manga. Um, the, you know, there's this concept of like a family head and a head family that kind of decides things for everyone else. Uh, you know, someone can't get married without the approval of the family head. Uh, and the family head has to be male. So there's an interesting thing where, you know, they're the Makioka sisters. You know, all of the blood, main blood relatives are all women. So when the older woman got married, rather than her taking his name, he actually took the Makioka name so that he could become the next head. So... It's kind of cool that he has to take on her name, but at the same time, it means that they'd rather have an outsider be the head of the family than a woman. Patriarchy. <laughs> um, but it's a really fascinating look at how things work. And if you're really interested in Japanese culture, there are some things you're going to pick up on. Uh, however, the bulk of the book is very much slow piece by piece story of just like their daily monthly lives um you know the key the main sort of like through line is that the second youngest sister uh hasn't been married yet and um is rapidly aging out of the ideal age um you know she's heading for her 30s and then she hits her 30s and that they sort of got a reputation of being picky over her partners but now, <laughs> now and then it gradually gets to a point where they'll take anyone um so getting to see the sort of like semi arranged nature of arranged marriages in japan was really interesting um like it's never quite as far as the family decides for her and she has to go with it um even though she kind of says that it's okay if they just pick for her uh she definitely does have agency because she turns someone down because she thinks they're a bit thoughtless and not very kind. You also get to see how they react when one of the sisters doesn't get off the rails but just completely behaves in a way that they don't expect. You know, she wants to be independent She or she says that she wants to open her own sewing shop or sell dolls um, and once it gets to her sewing dresses the family is not happy with this. You know, it's again it's that traditional thing of she's a well-to-do lady in Japan so they would rather that she was a looked after housewife than a working woman um but I, I never felt like that stuff was going over the top you know was it two months ago when I read Green Banks which was again a similar era interestingly but it's the UK um but a lot of misogynistic uh, sort of like things are being said and that really angered me but here everything just felt a lot softer <laughs> uh, and plus we're seeing everything through the women's eyes so we're never really going to get a huge a lot a huge amount of misogyny other than just like the society and the sort of like um patterns that they're in 
in the end I did really enjoy my time with it. Um, I'm actually kind of amazed that I didn't get bored earlier because it's quite a chunky book um, and I think I've said before that family drama isn't really my thing um, but I think because it's I felt like I was also learning a bit about Japan along the way um, for example one thing I wasn't aware of was that uh, people in Japan will not celebrate but they will mark the anniversary of someone's death um but sort of like uh wedding anniversaries in the west there's certain years that are more important um you know if it's they might ignore the fourth year but make a point of going the fifth year uh so that was it really interesting so i think if you have an interest in japan and the culture and sort of want to see where the culture was at that time. Uh, I, I think there's definitely going to be something in this for you. The sailor who fell from grace with the sea. The housekeeper and the professor. These are the two novellas that are part of the Japanese vintage collection. And I could not feel more differently about these two books. <laughs> One I hated and one I absolutely adored. Let's talk about the one that I hate. <laughs> oh, the, mm, this book. Mm. <laughs> so I haven't finished Wind Up Bird Chronicle, uh, but I think this might end up being the only one out of the collection that I uh, actively dislike. I... No. <laughs> this is like... Uh, there's something about it that's like really trying to be edgy. I, I don't like that. I hate that bullshit. <laughs> this is about a mother and her son and their experience when a sailor comes to a port and gets to know the mother and ends up falling into a relationship with her. The boy is kind of messed up. He is fallen into this friendship group uh, that has a bit of a leader. And this leader is like messed up. Um, there's So graphic warning, there is a scene where they do something really horrible to a kitten um and it really it's so messed up um and i i had to hold my cat after because it was really horrible um i mean i wouldn't recommend this book anyway but if that is something you feel like you can't read just absolutely stay away um but it's all about like oh, feelings are terrible, you know, kindness is a weakness, um, you know, we're, we've got to become strong men. Um, and so for a while they, well, they don't admire, the blurb makes it seem like they admire the sailor when they meet him, um, but that's not really the case. I'm like ambivalent at best. Um, but then as the sailor ends up kind of giving up his life on sea, to become a husband um, they see that he's like he's oh this is it he's become weak oh he's gonna be he's gonna be your dad and that's terrible and then the thing is even the sailor says some like weird shit <laughs> like early on he's he says that the reason why he's never had a relationship before or he's never done anything different um, you know, he, it's not like he's in love with being a sailor, uh, but he feels like he's destined for something great. And you're like, yeah, pal, yeah, I'm sure, whatever. <laughs> I mean, don't think you are, but okay. Um, yeah, I hate it. I hate it. <laughs> it's, it's the edgy, edgiest nonsense. And I just, like, and it's one of those, it's like, 
Is he also trying to say something? Is he also trying to say that, like, is this a Lord of the Flies situation? Is he like, oh, all boys are terrible people? And then I found out something interesting. <laughs> so this is going to be a little side note. Hi, editing Emma here. So in the interest of saving you five minutes of history and politics, uh, I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going to shrink down what I said. Uh, so basically, I found out who this guy was. He is someone that I'd actually previously read about in my uh, brief history of Japan, uh, of modern Japan. Um, and why I thought it was funny is because when I learned about this guy to begin with, I actually kind of thought he was a bit of a joker. Um, <laughs> uh, and I was very cynical about him and his politics anyway, uh, so connecting him to this book that he'd written uh, was quite amusing. Um, so I didn't feel so bad at not liking this book. Um, in fact, let's say more than that, I hated it. And after I finished this, um, I did try to get through this in two or three sittings. Uh, I did not want to be reading it for longer than I had to. Which is in stark contrast to The Housekeeper and the Professor. So I read the first 40 pages of Housekeeper and the Professor and I decided that I would have to pace myself because I did not want this to end. <laughs> this book is just pure, wholesome loveliness in the face of something that's quite sombre and sad. So the professor has a memory issue um, you know, this is Memento. Every day he's going to wake up and forget everything that happens. Um, in fact, it's actually quicker than that. I think it's like a four hour cycle. So every four hour, four hours he'll reset and forget everything. Um, so he's had housekeepers and he's had nearly 10 of them because the assumption is never said, but obviously the assumption is that they either get tired of explaining things to him or they just are a bit too bummed by the situation. So in enters our main character and she is just incredible. She helps him as much as she can. Um, she's very patient with him. You know, she really wants to look after the man. Um, and then at some point the professor finds out that she has a son uh, who is home alone while she's looking after him. Uh, because the agency that she works for doesn't allow children to be around on the job. And the professor is not happy with this. He says that she must start bringing him. Uh, she mentions that the agency is sort of is given an exception. And the professor um, absolutely loves the kid. <laughs> you know, he can be like quite... Um, cold and uh, like brush people off but he loves children um in a you know completely sweet innocent way and he just falls that he will do anything for this kid um and so you kind of they fall into this routine of the three of them hanging out every day um and the professor helping him uh the kid with homework so the main not crux of the book, but I mean through line is that he is a professor of mathematics and this becomes sort of like a key point in bringing them together. Um, obviously her and her son don't really care about maths until they meet him and but they start to learn these interesting things and he sort of gives them puzzles and they will walk, go away and actually start looking up numbers and getting interested in mathematics and equations um, and like he nicknames the kid Root because it look he's got a flat head <laughs> that's like the square root symbol um, and he helps uh, the kid with his homework and there's a part where she says oh I thought it would sort of like be below him because he's so he is ultra mathematician you know he's so far beyond the normal person um but no he's really excited to teach him and give him these puzzles uh, that are at his level uh, and it's just 
so lovely. Um, and other, there's moments that happen um, that are you know quite dramatic and sad because he does have this condition um, and things happen where he's you know a bit confused. Um, so the, for some people, if you have experiences with that, unfortunately that might hit too close to home. Um, but if you feel ready to, uh, this book is incredible. I absolutely loved it. Um, it has been the highlight of this series so far and I can definitely see me rereading it in the future because sometimes it's just really nice to be plunked into a story in a world where someone is just really nice <laughs> and kind um, you know I mentioned Fruit Basket earlier I'm can you tell I've been really watching it um, <laughs> you know, in the same way that you love Toru because she's just so innocently kind to everyone uh, and puts everyone first um, and it's just really nice to be around characters like that and both the housekeeper and the kid are just so caring about the professor um, you know, they really want to do things that are, like, that are special to him even if he'll forget it um, you know they want his life to be as good as it can be and that's just lovely and is something we always need I think so yeah please read this book <laughs> if I keep talking about it I will start crying it's so cute um, and I think I'm out of books <laughs> I think I've discussed everything so it was nice to end on a highlight um, as I mentioned before, I will be doing a whole review of the Japanese classics, so uh, if you are interested in some of the other books that I get to today, uh, look forward to that. So remember, don't read this one, read this one. <laughs> bad, good, bad, good. <laughs> okay, that'll do it for today. Uh, thanks for watching and I'll see you soon. Bye!